das Raw, ey. Das ist Raw. Hallo und willkommen. <lacht> Yeah, so with that, let's get started. So ladies and gentlemen, we have the very famous Nicholas Strangford here in this vlog. A uh, very spontaneous vlog, actually, we just met up in Cape Town. It was not planned. I did not know that they were coming here, nor did you know that coming. So I'm very glad we made this happen. Nicholas Strangford, uh, for those who don't know him, so if you're from Germany, you've probably heard about him. You have over 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. Been on all of the TV shows. Nicholas uh, so did it in Cambridge, the University of Cambridge Computer Science. So he did the undergrads in Hamburg in Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Um, passing with fine flowers and later working on and Meta or Facebook as it was called back then. Then you left Facebook in a very interesting way. Um, partially because of the YouTube channel, right? Now I started working for Master School, which is a really cool startup that raised over a hundred million dollars and joined as a VP. And well, now I think we can also talk about what just happened recently. You're no longer in master school, and I actually don't know yet what happened. So this is something I just found out moments ago. So I'm super excited to talk about that. But let us get started with why are we in South Africa actually? Well, uh, we <clears throat> we both attended this incredible not festival but burn, and we could talk about that later if you like because you called it a festival, and I always thought it's a technicality. But now that I lived this really, through this incredible one week experience, which transformed my life, literally, it was life changing for the past week. Um, I know it's a band, a lot of festivals, it's a very, <laughs> very, very special site, type of event. And uh, we both went. It's uh, Burning Man Regional in South Africa, it's, I believe, the largest one after the one, the original one in Nevada. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, Africa Burn, and then the third would be Mid Burning Israel, which we wanted to. My girlfriend, who's sitting in the background, uh, maybe join us spontaneously <laughs> or impromptu uh, uh, conversations or not. Um, but yeah, we, went to, we wanted to go to Mid Burn. She didn't get a visa because she's Turkish and they were striking and all sorts of things. Nah. Yeah, now uh, we said we have to go to Africa Burn instead, which was the best decision of my life. Um, and then very funny when I made an Instagram story from Cape Town, you said, wait, what? I'm in Cape Town. I'm Where coming Cape with Town? Alexander, who I also know and I've worked with. And like, very, very funny. Uh, we never got to meet though at the burn. We yeah. never met up because there was no internet connection and we did find it. Yes, that was so weird. So you sent me the license plate, a picture of your car. And I actually spent a good 40 minutes walking around searching for a car. There are 10,000 people, as so you can imagine. It's a bit hard to do that. And I did not find you. I saw so many cars that look identical to yours, just a different license plate. At some point, I was like, okay, I'm going to spontaneously run into you. But that did not happen. Or maybe we did, like, we're very close, but in the darkness with all the costumes. It's funny if I ended up being in some way in your vlog in the background. In the background shots. So you can watch my vlog, and maybe you see Nicholas Steinfeld, you can identify his face somewhere. Yeah, I hope it's uh, it's not uh, doing the, the burn of the clan. Were you filming that? Um, I was not supposed to know, I was not familiar. What happened there? Do, do you know where I could... Oh, you were one of these people! Did you see, did you see <laughs> the big bird? Yes, I did. The, and did you see there were like uh, people running around it naked? Completely naked? Yeah, yeah, that was one. That was one. <laughs> you were one yeah. of the best, so cool. So, oh, uh, you're, we're gonna talk, we're talk about that. Yeah. You're gonna come back to that. But please blow my penis. Yes, I will. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I have my face. No, I'm kidding. Do what I mean, like... But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been dead. That's what are you going to talk about? Yes. Let's, let's do some of the more uh, related like, the topics that are more related to my channel. So I'm really curious about your studies. You started studied in Cambridge. I currently live in the, I call it the fake Cambridge, which is, it is the fake Cambridge. It is the fake Cambridge. You went to the original Cambridge. I went to Harvard and MIT. I'm really curious to hear about what your studies were like in Cambridge. How did you end up there? And um, what it really makes is the difference. Like, what do you? If you, if you could go back in time, would you go to the U.S. rather, but sit to Harvard, or would you still choose the U.K.? Oh, interesting. I mean, I haven't been, right? I mean, I, I love the U.S. I think if I had to choose just one country to live in, it would probably be the United States, actually. Um, the only thing that's bad about the States is that it's so far from Europe. Yeah. I, all <laughs> my, my relationships with like friends, family, girlfriend, everything is in, in Europe, and there you can just take a two-hour train from London, you're in Paris, uh, which is something I'd miss. But in terms of country, I would definitely study at some point in the United States and something like Harvard or MIT sounds fantastic. Generally, um, I was happy studying my bachelor's degree at the very normal university, which was the University of Hamburg, not elite or prestigious and can I had a good time. Would I choose it again? Well, you know, people always say I would do all the same again because they are happy where they ended up, which is great. Yeah. Um, 
But I think it's a bit of a poor answer, right? I mean, uh, I'm happy where, where I'm now, but still if I would give it, but if I were to give advice, I'd say uh, getting in the work is really prestigious investors, super cool, not because they do better teaching, but just because uh, they are so selected that the peer group is just insane, right? Yeah, and you, you know, know you, you know this and you show this on your on your vlog that it's just, um, it's just a very different vibe because the selection uh, is so strong. Although occasionally people also sneak it without selection, which is what I did. Uh, I actually got into Cambridge. Why did you sneak in? You're yeah. smart. I sneaked into Cambridge. I didn't uh, pass the Cambridge uh, interviews. It's pretty tough to get into the bachelors. You have to go there. You have to actually spend a few days. You have to do these really, really difficult questions uh, with fellows at the college. And I got into Trinity College, Cambridge, which is kind of like, it's like, like a creme de la creme, right? Yeah. It's like within Cambridge. When I, when I went there in 2015, I think they dropped a lot since, but in 2015, Cambridge was number one in maths, worldwide. Yeah. Trinity College is number one within Cambridge for maths. Yeah. I sneaked it. Uh, and how did <laughs> I do it? I, um, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing uh, serendipity, really. I um, had this scholarship. Uh, I had this scholarship uh, called the Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes, the German National Academic Foundation. It's um, also how we met, which is uh, how we met there, which I'm saying we met at one of the <laughs> yes. language courses in France. And um, they, at the time, had an informal collaboration with Trinity College Cambridge. So informal that it wasn't even announced anywhere. I don't so know. Yeah. Let's see, that, and that's the thing about the German student initiative film, that they have all, all sorts of official partners. But then there are these unofficial partners, they're not in the intranet in the Daedalus net mm -hmm. uh, uh, on, on their website, but uh, you just have to know the right people. Oh. So um, I was attending as a computer science student in Hamburg, I was attending a graph theory seminar uh, with the mathematics faculty just for fun. Uh, that was part of my bachelor's degree. And I uh, did a decent job in that seminar. The professor liked me and then he came to me and said, you have the student scholarship, you should go to Cambridge. And I was like, how does he know? How does he know I have the scholarship? Well, just before the seminar, he went to see a colleague. And this was a professor who I worked for as a, as a student tutor, and who also wrote my recommendation letter for the student shifter to extend my scholarship. And then as this professor Diestes, his name, very famous graph theorist, put his, his sheet of attendance on the table in this other professor's uh, cabinet, um, in, in his office, uh, he would be like, oh, Nicholas Steinfeld, uh, I know this guy, he's good. He, uh, <laughs> how do you know him? Oh, I wrote the recommendation for the stewardship. Just because this guy, at that time, put the sheet of paper, the list of attendance on the, this other professor's desk, he came to me, he knew I had the scholarship, he talked to me about Cambridge, he used to be a professor at Cambridge, he's still a fellow, he studied there as well, and he told me I should go and study the part two of the Mathematical Triplus, which is the third year of the bachelor's degree in maths at Cambridge University, as a visitor. And I was like, oh, I've never heard about that collaboration, I will think that's it. And he was like, ah, there's this guy in the studio, write, write an email. I wrote an email, and he was like, yeah, that's true, we have a relationship with Trinity College, send me your CV, just as a PDF, yeah, just as a PDF. I sent it. And a week later, Cambridge, the admissions office, called Professor Diston in Hamburg. They called him on the phone, they're like, there's this guy, should we take him? And he said, yeah, take him. And that's it? And that's how I got into Cambridge. Wow, okay, this is, this is an incredible story. I mean, yeah. the normal way is like, obviously you apply, then the abnormal way, at least in the US, is you have some super rich parents who make a little donation of a few million dollars, and that's how he gets in. This is something that I haven't heard that. This is like really incredible, I managed to pull that off. But then you actually got into a master's degree program. I did regularly apply uh, to the master's degree program, yes. Yeah, so you got admitted like in full normal way. Yes, so I, I spent one year at Cambridge as a visitor. In the, even though I had completed my bachelor's degree in computer science, I did third year bachelor's degree in maths. Mm -hmm. And then I loved it. I mean, Cambridge is an insane yeah. place. Insane. So, so good. And then uh, I wanted to stay. I had to stay. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to do the master's degree. It's one year. Uh, so I did. I stayed for another year, but fight regularly this time. Uh, I got admitted, and uh, it was funny because I kind of applied as an external student because I wasn't a regular Cambridge student. I was a visitor, so I was yeah. like, I did my master's degree at Hamburg, uh, which was a selected external application. Did all the master's degree application just in the kind of last field, kind of 
anything you want to add. Also, oh, by the way, I'm already here. Yeah. <laughs> right, so it was weird. I, they even made me do an English test, which I hadn't done for my first year, right? It was really weird. Like, so I'd, I was in Cambridge, I was studying, and then to apply for the master's, I had to do an IELTS. So I went to the IELTS yeah. test center. They maybe do that. Care, I, I, I went to the admissions office first. I complained. I was like, I'm here, I'm standing in front of you. Clearly speaking English. My supervisors can give you like a letter uh, and this kind of stem for language. No. So I, ha I didn't need an English test to get into Cambridge, but I needed one to stay there. That was just funny. Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes bureaucracy is really, is really fascinating. But it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I returned to the magical years in this Harry Potter place. And uh, how's it like uh, to be there? Oh, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, if you put into Google Trinity College Cambridge Great Hall, it really does look like the Great Hall in Harry Potter. When I read Harry Potter, I thought Great Hall is like a Hogwarts term. But it's, it's just a normal term in Cambridge, Oxford, yeah. right? Every college is at all. And uh, I think the US also, like some of these prestigious universities, copied this system and this vibe, right? We yeah. created it. And uh, the colleges are kind of like houses. Uh, yeah. Everyone knows St. John's is Slytherin, and the Trinity, unfortunately, will be Ravenclaw. And, uh, <laughs> I suppose Gryffindor would be Jesus College, in my opinion, and Hufflepuff is Homerton. I don't know if any uh, Ken Tabs, as we call them, in the fellow Cambridge students in the comment section, but uh, you can see kind of such a, just like these US universities, Cambridge, they, they have their own terminology, they have their own, own English words, they, it's, it's such a weird, close society, but very magical once you get it, very magical, um, it's very Harry Potter vibe, um, I mean, I remember so distinctly my admissions dinner, you walk into the Great Hall, Trinity College, you see Henry VIII, right, big wow. portraits everywhere, you have four long tables for the students with benches to sit on like the four houses in Harry Potter and then you have a high table for the professor and I was like what this just looks exactly like Hogwarts and uh, add in the feeling that Isaac Newton was just like me I'm eating my porridge here for breakfast Isaac Newton was eating his porridge on the in that very hall every morning and it's an incredible spirit it's an incredible vibe but I just yeah. feeling I have a feeling always when I go into Harvard by the library they also have this big wall like the study hall and just sitting there knowing that I think eight US presidents have sat in these exact same chairs in the years, you know, before me and have been studying there's just it's just inspirational in some way. Yeah. Just think like, wow, I'm sitting here and I might be able to accomplish that too. In some way. Yeah, I, I guess so. Although uh yes, US, 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 US president uh, you have to be born in the US. Well yeah, I mean yeah. I, I, I suppose we all done that one, but uh, yeah. Great thinkers have wandered through these halls, and uh, it's, it's magical. It's very inspiring. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think about studying computer science? Should people try to study computer science as opposed to you know some very theoretical things such as I did physics? Because I personally would read studying physics. Actually, I'm wondering, would you would you say the people who are you know skilled for it and are good at it should usually pick computer science? Yeah, it's funny because there's this kind of hierarchy of purity, right? And the purer the subject is, but people tend to almost look down on the more applied stuff. Yeah. So I studied pure mathematics at Cambridge, um, by the way. I didn't do computer science. I, I, the two years at Cambridge were a complete excursion for my computer science mm -hmm. career. Um, I was doing like graph, I was even doing logic and set theory. Which is oh wow, okay, that's extreme. Yeah. Not useful by any means. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not pursuing an academic career, right? So it's, uh, it was very much not applied, not even applied maths, it was pure. And uh, the purists, they'd be like, oh, this is like the real deal, this is, the, this is reality. I do have to say that I self-identify as a computer scientist and I went back to computer science afterwards and I worked as a software engineer and I did not pursue an academic career. And for me, that's the right thing to do. I, I love building, I love doing things in the real world. I wouldn't want to do an academic career anyway, even though originally for a long time I thought that would be my thing. I love teaching mm -hmm. and I like this kind of grandeur that comes with this academic title, being a professor, it's very nice. But I feel that I really like trying different things. Yeah. And I, if I had to choose going very deeply into one topic or learning a little bit about many things, I would always choose that. It's more exciting. I'm, I'm much more of a generalist, and academics, academia is just is just not very generalist friend. Um, it, it, what gets rewarded is going super, super, super narrow and finding this tiny new thing that no one's found before, but 
probably isn't that big of a deal, right? You might yeah. get, you might do something big, of course, something to do something pretty big, but it's like yeah. uh, from the guy or something. Like, chances are on-page yeah. use, but chances are you're, you're working on something very, very, very small, narrow part in a subfield of a subfield of a subfield. Yeah. Isn't for me. And I'm also so much of an extrovert, so just spending 90% of my time like kind of reading books and researching, it wasn't the right thing for me. And kind of with a similar logic, I love what I love about computer science is that it has this like academic part. And I actually did direct to computer science for my bachelor's degree as well as the focus. And I did a lot of algorithms and um, I, my bachelor's degree was in, uh, my, my thesis was about model checking and uh, uh, it, it was very theoretical. Um, but then I ended up working as a software engineer. Yeah. And then I ended up working in, in business development. And uh, I mean, now I'm a YouTuber and I could, the computer science background is super useful in all of these. It gives you a much more so than a pure mathematics degree. Yeah. So I think computer science is a safer bet if you feel like you're interested in different things. But in the end of the day, people should study what they enjoy most. Because actually, okay, this is something where I want to push back as all this. People studying what they enjoyed. I enjoyed physics to most, so I studied physics. But I would always say, chances are you're going to change your work over time. You know, fields change, your personality changes, and just because maybe you like one thing slightly more than the other thing, unless in my case I preferred physics slightly over computer science, I decided to do physics, not taking into account that actually computer science gives me so much flexibility, whereas physics, it's kind of you know, it just goes in one direction. You have to be razor sharp focused. So I would say, yes, if somebody says, okay, physics is all I love, or you know, something very niche, then do that, pursue that, and you're gonna be great at it. But if you're like unsure and have like multiple things that you want to do, I think a good advice is <laughs> pick something that has that is very practical. It gives you the flexibility because sooner or later you're gonna to want to switch your career in some way anyways. So. But you can anyway, I mean you know, look you're a startup founder. I even yeah. he, this idea of video physics degree, right? It didn't really hold, hold you back that much. And we're talking about an undergrad choice, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe PhDs too much. Maybe for you it was like, maybe it wasn't the right choice, right? Maybe you were after something that wasn't what you wanted. But um, I think university shouldn't just be a job education. It shouldn't just be training to be this specific role. I think that's a very old fashioned view of viewing it. Yeah. It is a very good way of viewing it. So, um, I think it's fine to study physics and then work as an investment banker, right? Do that. I mean, I, I, I'm German and in Germany, uh, there's this, I would say there's even more of a bias to like study one thing and then become a certain, certain role, a certain job. In the US it's actually, isn't it already pretty general? Like there's a lot of like you study all sorts of things and then it's fairly normal to pursue a career in something else. So I think it's, it's well, it's fine if you just go for a bachelor's degree that you like. I have a friend who studied history, now he's a lawyer. I uh, studied computer science, now I, I'm not a computer scientist in my job. Yeah, I think it's fine. Uh, of course, I also, what I meant by study what you want or what you enjoy is like study a thing that you enjoy. I totally give you have this very slight preference, but something else is much more practical. Sure, that's fine. I yeah. just don't believe in doing like a business to you because you want to make money, but you really hate business. I, I yeah, don't work. think it makes sense. Yeah, you, you have, have to like follow your energy, you have to follow your passion. Um, I was in the same boat. I mean, I had a long list of things I could have done. And probably I, slide, I, I slightly preferred philosophy over computer science. Oh, I right. probably would have chosen philosophy over of pure interest. Perfect. It was also yeah. on top of the list. But then uh, I was like, okay, if I... If, I could do a philosophy degree, then work as a taxi driver and study computer science. <laughs> but I could also study computer science first and then work as a software engineer and study philosophy. Yeah. Which I didn't end up doing, but, but I attended some philosophy lectures as part of my economy. So, that's that's so uh, do something that you enjoy, that's for sure. Yeah. And maybe you can choose number two or number three on your list. But even there, like, you can do almost anything. So if you do, it, definitely a bachelor's degree isn't going to close to off. I, I strongly beef it. So that's true. Yeah, yeah. there's a joke that if you study, that. if you study uh, philosophy, you know you're gonna end up having the only option to be a philosophy teacher. It's essentially, university is kind of a giant pyramid scheme. It just mm -hmm. keeps you inside, and you train more, you more new people to study philosophy. But obviously, it's kind of just a joke. Yeah. You said you mentioned the US just now, and I want to point out one one thing. That I'm not exactly sure if I quote, I'm quoting it directly. You said the only thing I don't like about America is it's far away from Europe. I think people would really push back from that. I mean, there's a lot of things wrong with the US, right? Uh, you could very easily think of a point that, you know, 
health insurance, um, you know, bad like bad education if you don't have money, inequality, and all of these things. Do you really see how do you see the U.S. at the moment compared to the Europe and the U.K.? Oh, I mean, it's so tough because uh, every country is kind of broken, and uh, I'm not. Even, I mean, I must say, over the past few years, and this was pro or something like it, in a huge spiral of other topics. I'm not the biggest fan of governments slightly, and the, I uh, maybe this last week of being in this burn and this kind of. Uh, anarchy if based society has uh, strengthened that further <laughs> but um, I uh, yeah I'm not a very happy taxpayer I'm gonna be straight and there's no country where I'm like oh this is such a great country I love the laws and I uh, uh, love that they don't allow me to uh, purchase psychedelics in the supermarket we can talk about that later I, I think uh, there's so much wrong. There's some laughing in the back. There's already. so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Life audience. Uh, yeah, you can always join us on the sofa. And um, but uh, I'm not in the uh, laid back vibe of this podcast though. But uh, no. Um, uh, so uh, you can pick bad things and good things about Anchor. Okay. Yeah. I like to, uh, that the US is quite a big country. It is a reasonably weak state compared to some European countries. And if you are more on the state critical side like I am, um, you like that vibe. Yeah. Um, I like the convenience. I like um, the size. I like uh, the uh, relative role business uh, the nature of things. Um, the healthcare system's rubbish for sure. I mean, uh, it, it could be. It if could, you don't have money, it could be bad. But if you don't have money, yes. Yeah. Uh, the whole university system is a bit weird, right? Like people are paying like absurd amount, absurd amounts of money um, and then uh, again, getting a philosophy degree the amount of, <laughs> getting a philosophy degree the amount of credit card that sure there are bad things but then um, it's not I mean look at the United Kingdom I mean uh, look at Brexit look at uh, how uh, how the European countries have been uh, striving to navigate for the past three years and you find broken things everywhere. you do and I think the US they make it very easy to finger point at the issues, you know, yes. I could just give you a bullet list of things that are wrong. Yeah. But if I have to explain what is wrong with Germany, I have to essentially make a whole YouTube video, which I didn't, by the way, uh, about why Germans are often very, you know, narrow-minded. They don't, you know, they don't encourage you to do something crazy. I have it with my family. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, you know, for them, it's like, okay, you study physics, you're going to become a physicist, and, you know, that's what you have to focus on. And one thing, you don't do crazy stuff on the side. And that's why we don't have any uh, kind of, uh, that we don't do many meaningful innovation in Germany. Right. That's right. I mean, we happily order on Amazon and uh, order, uh, we, we order stuff from Amazon and we uh, drive around in Ubers and we, then we go to eat the McDonald's or uh, go to the next Starbucks or use Apple products and we like kind of benefit from all of the innovation coming out of the United States and then they're like, oh, people, poor people can't afford healthcare and yeah. oh, look how weird they are about this and then all the Americans, bloody Americans. Um, what has Germany done in the past few decades? I mean, not that much really, yeah. frankly. So, of course, if you don't do much, if you don't risk much, if you don't have much output, um, if you the, the best uh, internet uh, connection you can find in some central parts of Hamburg is in the, uh, has to be measured in kilobits, then uh, sure, uh, maybe you're also less vulnerable to criticism. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would be very careful as a country like Germany to uh, sit on a high. Yeah, I think particularly the German side is very opposed to kind of this U.S. mindset. I mean, the countries are obviously get great allies, uh, no doubt about that. It's just this whole mindset, you know, in the U.S., I feel like people encourage you to do something. You know, if you do something crazy, they're not just going to say, oh, you know, what are the risks? Are you sure you want to do that? They're going to be like, oh, that's cool. You're doing something crazy, starting a YouTube channel. This is cool. I like them. They're different. Yeah. Or you're starting a startup. You're taking a risk. That's good. And if you fail, you know, it doesn't matter. You try again. Yeah. But I feel like in Germany, it's like, can you start a startup, like, are you sure it's dangerous to do that? Don't you just want to focus on your career? And then if you fail, which we have, is likely to happen, they're going to be like, yeah, I told you so, you failed. And if you make a lot of money, then they're going to be like, oh, yeah, you have this, you're spending so much money on your house, you're spending way too much money. It makes you look like a bad person. Yeah, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even consider starting a business in Germany. I have to say, like, I, I think it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's just not an option. And um, yeah, I mean, it's not life is just about business. And, For sure. Uh, uh, we used to write good books and compose good symphonies. So, <laughs> um, but even that these days, I mean, come on. 
And I live, I'm a, and uh, I, I, I love my country and I, I love going back all the time, but, uh, and they're good people there. But uh, again, I'm just saying we should be very careful to just to kind of blame the US, US for this, for that. that um, it'd be hard to make a case that Germany is a better country than the United States. Very difficult case. Yeah. Very difficult case. What even is a good country? Um, good things and bad things. Where, wherever and whenever you it's yeah, and also just to clarify, it's in the same way. I like Germany actually. I think you know people live good lives there. Uh, you don't have to be the next Definitely. tech startup person to you know be a good person and have a good life. No doubt about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why don't we actually talk about the really burning topic that I want to talk about? Uh, Africa bird. No, actually, let's talk about before we move on to that. Let's talk about what happened with Master School. So you started you know a big change in the beginning of this year, uh, or was it the last year? You left Facebook, made a lot of really cool videos about it. So they're all in German, but I can link them if you understand the German. And then you went to master's school, a startup with a lot of funding, everything super hot. And just before this, suddenly Alexander tells me, oh yeah, Nicholas is not visible in master's school internal system. I'm like, what? Did he just leave? Did he, is a technical error? So he actually left, what happened? I left, yes, and I will have announced it when this is out. Um, so and, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting uh, kind of development because I did join just uh, in January last year and it has been an amazing ride. I mean, mm -hmm. the startup world, as you know, is so exciting and being uh, master schools in a very unique position in this market. They raised a hundred million dollar seed 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 round. Wait, well, how's that even possible? So, exactly, that's what everyone says. I it might be the biggest ever seed round in education. Is it, it's it's massive. I mean, Google the Master School seed. It's a, it's a very very big seed round, and um, they uh, have also just closed a lot of debt financing, and things are going very well. And uh, yeah, hundred million dollar seed was unlikely then. It's impossible now, right, in this market. Yeah. And um, I tried to. I joined. <laughs> uh, I joined at a wonderful time uh, because I uh, yeah, I mean, I joined uh, with a lot of equity and a high salary. Which is normally so deal. Right? Well, normally you try to get and go for one, and then I, uh, yeah. uh, I, uh, I was making more money uh, than uh, I was at Facebook. Uh, kind of basically as much as I would have made at Facebook if I had continued. Mm -hmm. Which is a lot of money. I know we had like three hundred thousand US dollars. I was just spending about salary. So oh, yeah. uh, for those interested, is uh, in the US, it's even more. Of course, if you work as a software, yeah, yeah that's crazy. You can make like half of this. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. After a couple of years, but. Um, it's, it's a very good salary, uh, and in a startup, it's it's insane. And I, I was given a lot of responsibility. I was leading the business development. I was leading really interesting initiatives. I have, I I guess to say I have uh, because I appreciate him so much. But I, I had the best boss you can imagine. It was incredible. Um, bunch of things. First of all, last year was one of the most exciting and transformative years of my life. It was also the one that felt the least healthy and the most stressful. I was ill all the time. Probably once a month, at least, I had like severe cold, some kind of flu feeling. Uh, I had to cancel PT sessions left and right. Uh, I was in all sorts of problems, uh, back pain. And I was feeling stressed and uh, I was just doing too much. I mean, I was, uh, I was going hard uh, on the YouTube channel. I was really trying to push. I was going hard in uh, master school. You know, it started where it was very hectic. and. And then even in my free time, I was uh, working out in the gym, hoping uh, to uh, achieve this I'm in a Bosch body camp <laughs> one day. And then uh, it, when I was going, I was like, oh, I have free time. I go out clubbing, but then um, going to like uh, um, techno raves or take ecstasy pills isn't really also kind of the type of balancing relaxation that maybe your body requires. I right? need a vacation from that. It's, you need a vacation from vacations. And uh, I was just living life and working and playing and all of that a lot uh, and I sadly had to come to the realization uh, that maybe it is too much. Uh, it was hard to accept because you know I was like I, 28 at the time and yeah, everything yeah. got in German and the other podcast episode we recorded earlier a bit about this like, like from 18 to 28 sadly even though both are young ages was a noticeable difference also it was so too much and I just my body's just telling me no and then um, it's like making you a little sweet less, right? And uh, I went to Latin America. I had a wonderful 
three week break from everything. We went to Toulon, we went to Brazil, we went to all sorts of places and uh, I had a magical time and I wasn't working. And this kind of gave me time to pause and I was like, fuck, I feel the happiest I've ever been in the past year. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, um, I, I came back to London. I went back to London and I got ill. And I was like, this, this can't be it. I mean, mm-hmm. and I thought I want to achieve big dreams and I want to build something, I want to have a big career. But uh, am I sacrificing too much? And you were still working for master's school? I was registered to make for master's school, so it's a vacation. So I was in this kind of plot that just seeked. And then I just, well, I just had to face reality. The reality was, YouTube was feeling like a missed opportunity. Like the whole content creation, the whole business is that it could build around the B2C startups, right? It was just, YouTube isn't just a YouTube channel. It's like, have a YouTube channel, have a podcast, do be on TikTok, write a book, start a B2C business. And that felt like a missed opportunity, yeah. right? Doing my own thing felt like a missed opportunity because doing it as a hobby, I managed to build something that would finance my living expenses that grew into like a, no, it's a business and uh, a lot of subscribers, uh, but it felt much, much, much more than it could be if I went full-time. And then at the same time, being in a strategic position and an ambitious startup uh, is also something that you can't read half of, right? Yeah, and I'm pretty deal. It was just, it was just a clash, and I had to choose one. And my, I mean, financially, even though YouTube is, is making money at the time with my equity, with my salary, with everything, master school seemed like the safer and better bet. Most of my income, more than fifty percent, was from master school, but my energy. And my passion was driving me to do my own thing. Yeah. And uh, having the best boss in the world seemed still worse than having no boss at all and doing your own thing. <laughs> and I just had to fix that. And I, uh, I went to, I set myself a deadline. I had this trip to Tel Aviv. Um, and I went to Tel Aviv and about this time I had to decide. And then I decided, then I went to my boss and I told them, you know, uh, I get more energy out of my own business and my social media activities and I want to pursue that full time. And uh, he, he, he thought about the effect and he said, if that's what gives you energy, everything else is a waste of time and you should focus on it. And he's a great guy and really I appreciate uh, his guidance so much. And um, yeah, he, he encouraged me and said, you should, yeah, you should be and you should, uh, you should, you should do it. And I jumped and uh, I would have announced that really purely for, for the sake of his uh, complete freedom in my planning complete self-reliance, independence, building my own business. Uh, and the general want to do maybe 80% of how much of what I've been doing last year, mm-hmm. but relatively much more uh, on the YouTube side. Uh, I left and I'm now a full-time content creator. Oh, wow. Although, and, <laughs> although again, I don't like to say I'm just a YouTuber. And we talked about this earlier. It's, it's, it's tricky because also you made this really good point. You put your finger in the wound in the German part as you're saying, well, the problem if you only do YouTube is kind of this like, it's this self-referential thing, right? There are a lot of kind of creators. They're kind of talking about how they're a creator and it's like, there's nothing else. Um, and, and, and this is something that does bore me. And I'm like, isn't the interesting part about myself this like software engineer at Facebook, VPN mm-hmm. master school and like the other things I do so I can document something. And I guess what, what gives me hope are two things. First of all, I do seem to retain at least a certain decent minimum audience, whatever I talk about. So there is enough interest in kind of how I explain things and how I talk about things. So that's nice. Second, I'm not going to lose my career background. So I can always talk about that part. And it, uh, I still have a, like the vast majority of my audience is actually quite interested in school, studying, entering the job world. And this is something that my content is going to focus on quite a lot, right? So this whole journey of like a university degree, you go abroad, maybe you join a big corporate, maybe you work in a startup. Um, and that part, I've done it. And uh, I'm not just an influencer who's famous for being famous. I'm not this, not this Kardashian style of influence. Yeah. But there is something that was achieved at least in the part. Yeah, and then you'll still the same person. I'm the same person going forward. There'll be new things. I mean, there'll be a startup, there'll be a book, there'll be all sorts of things. So um, I'm excited about that. For the next few months, I'm just going to be making content, content, content. Uh, but I'm also going to be releasing digital products and all sorts of things. So um, yeah, I'm super excited. So what really comes next? So you, when, when did you actually quit your job official? Um, 
officially saw April was my last month. Uh, yes, and I actually from well, now it's May first. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I only even uh, worked for the first two weeks of April. Um, so I, I just got my I like two days ago. So I got my last salary, which was the April salary. Oh really? That's interesting. So you decided to leave, go to Africa, burn, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Yeah, which was such good timing as well, right? Yes, yes, that was very convenient timing. Much more convenient for you than for me. Yeah. Because I was not in the time when I should have done this, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, are you scared of when is going to come next? 100%. Um, it is a much less stable income. It's a much less stable workflow, right? It's so tempting to go to Africa, burn like events all the time. Yes. There's no boss that you're pissing off. There's no one telling you what to do, which is nice, but there's also no one telling you what to do. You know, yeah. it's like, yes, there isn't that guy that says in that structure, you have to create all the structure yourself. That's scary. You are then quite dependent on a proprietary platform, right? What if you do this much up? What if they change the algorithm? What if interest moves on? What if everyone saw TikTok, but my content doesn't really have work out on TikTok, right? What if I'm not thinking that? A lot of things can go wrong. I guess, at least in the next year or two, it shouldn't be so up to find a new job right? again, right? Uh, <laughs> it might not be a, as good a job, and that is a worry, right? I had a spectacular job, and the, the economy has changed, and uh, it'd be hard to get the same deal again. So um, that's the, I, I, would, I wouldn't be on, on the streets. I'd find a decent job with my biography. But uh, there's definitely a risk that I have, I've taken. But uh, Every investor also knows that risk equals opportunity, right? Yeah. I mean, risk and the versatility is what makes a, it makes a, a potential opportunity and the returns. So, um, uh, mostly I'm excited. I'm not, I wouldn't say worried, but uh, of course there's certain apprehension and there's a little bit of anxiety of like, what if, what is? And uh, there's only so much runway that I have, right, personally, and uh, there's no stable salary, and uh, what if the sponsors don't like me? But uh, first of all, I'm going to scale things a lot. I'm going to make a lot of more content. Then I'm going to release some digital products, right? The next natural step is to do some. Are you going to have merch? Because teen fights should. I, I merch and the, 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 the goal and the expanding version of last year. Alexander, would you buy it? You are right first. Uh, and the, I will get Alexander the merchandise he deserves, but. Um, I think uh, it, well, the, golden age, the golden days of merchandise are over sadly, otherwise I'd love the uh, Nikos Stiffer printed hoodie. But uh, I'll be thinking more, uh, I think digital products like Notion templates, online courses are quite exciting. Um, I would love to make, uh, make some apps and that sounds very old fashioned, but um, I, uh, I've, for example, the, the flashcard apps that I've been recommending, and they could be so so much better so I'm definitely going to make something better and uh, they are like everyone has a million startup ideas and uh, if you go to the B2C market where you have a decent size audience um, it's yeah, still it's a head start it's a very good head start I would love to write a book eventually um, so I have also things all sorts of things and um, as we talked also earlier in German focus is important and my, my, my main focus for now is just to make more content and I will kind of carry myself through the next few months to more serious YouTube sponsorships and that sort of stuff and just kind of enjoy making content because I also really do enjoy it. Like I love making videos, right? And being able to just dedicate all my time into making the best content possible is amazing, right? That I'm able to do that. Um, Long-term growth, just making videos, just called shit. It's hard, it's tough. It's yeah. tough. It can't be it. Can't be it. So anymore, it has to be reaches kind of a yeah. peak and yeah. after that, Oh, and my, my channel is, and that's scary, my channel is past its peak, right? My, I, I had more views a year ago than no. So, um, yeah, that's scary. Um, it's sad scary. for me, my channel is really at a very, very low at the moment. Yes, yes, I, I totally feel that. And uh, it's, a, it's a complete leap of faith, but it's just what I truly and deeply want to do. And I really think you have to follow your energy. Of course, it's, it is like, it's completely not working. If it's like just, you can't pay your bills, then uh, you, you end it, you, what gives you energy is just something that no one ever appreciates at all. And yeah. You might have to tweak it a little bit. But um, I mean, it's in a good enough place that it seems like a, like a decent move. And who knows, maybe in a year we'll be talking about our well, best decision ever, even on the financial side. It's cool, no, yeah, I didn't think of that. I mean, if you're at some point interested, I mean, my co founder is not ra are raising money at the moment, so I you know there are many opportunities there as well. Um, Let's talk. 
Do you, how do you feel about the whole stress thing? I mean, it said it affected you quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so. Don't you think that you will have the stress now again, just because, you know, the YouTube has to work it out and, you know, I have to make money. That's just a different form of stress. It could. And I, I suppose, I mean, stress is very subjective, right? And I think it's not so much about how much time you spend, it's also how many things revolve in your head. And doing these very different things and conflicts switch all the time because there's be between this, this employee mindset and master school and the entrepreneur, uh, YouTuber, uh, self-employed mindset. That was, that alone was very difficult. So just having this swarming world, which is my own business, which can come in all sorts of forms and shapes, but I think my own thing, I think that itself makes it easier. Yeah. And right now, it, I'm so drawn to it and it gives me so much energy that even if I end up spending more time, it will feel as stressful. But um, it's something you have to constantly check in on. And I do think that you have to accept your limits. You have to appreciate them. You have to try to build efficient routines. But if you are constantly stressed, and uh, like you said you were, uh, you probably have to change something. You can. Uh, it does surprise a lot of introspection uh, because uh, Life is a marathon indeed, right? But it's not a sprint and you have to enjoy the journey. You, goals don't make people happy. They don't. And I, earlier, I said this earlier, it's like you're always at the bottom of the exponential curve. If you get to the top, you're at the bottom again. It's t time is distribution. Your viewers are nerds, so they understand. And <laughs> it's, uh, it just doesn't make people happy, right? Uh, Master School raised $100 million C uh, C round. Do you think this makes the CEO happy? The CEO? He's thinking, of course, next thing. You made him happy for a day. Yeah, right. You open a bottle, done. Um, but uh, although they don't, they don't drink. Uh, we kiss. Uh, it's just like the first a different thing. But um, it doesn't make you happy. You have to enjoy what you're doing right now. It's such a dangerous trap to be like, oh, but I'm investing now. My returns are going to come in six months, yeah. or in a year, or in five years. I don't believe in that at all. And um, I think the key in life is to find a balance. Find a balance between investing in your future and enjoying the moment. And we just indeed had this uh, one week of uh, purely enjoying the moment. At least yeah. you were creating some luck, but I was really, I wasn't like, what, no, I wasn't thinking more than five minutes ahead mm -hmm. during this part. I was living, I was so present. And I now wanna, I wanna retain some of that. And I wanna find this balance. I wanna carve out these sacred times every single week to enjoy life. And um, to have the, have that downtime and slow down as well. Not just go and party, but go and party, yes, definitely. But I'm also slow down. And um, I do believe that it's achievable and that if we feel like, oh, those eight, nine hours a day aren't enough to achieve my dreams, you're probably not just working smart enough. And in sort of just trying to keep putting gas to the engine and uh, trying to force things and then feeling stressed out all the time and then maybe uh, sacrificing some of the golden golden years of your of your life uh, isn't yeah, isn't the right approach for sure. I said earlier, let's talk about a burning topic. But I was the burning topic was well, you quitting master school. But let's talk about a little bit burning topic, which is so we we said it already earlier. Yeah, we we didn't meet up here. We just coincidentally went here at the same time to the burns, which is for those who don't know, is a regional event of uh, Burning Man. So. I described it already early in, in a German podcast, but essentially it's in the middle of a desert, be it Nevada, Israel, or South Africa. A bunch of people, you know, meet up. It can be 10,000 people in case of Africa, burn. I think Burning Man is like 60, 70,000. And really in the middle of nowhere, there's literally nothing. They build up a whole city of craziness. I can't describe it in any other way. Everyone is dressed weird. And there was one guy who was dressed like normally, and it looked so weird and out of place in that town whole situation it is such an interesting experience so you were there for the whole beat yes i was the only nature i think i didn't really immerse myself into the whole burning man uh burn experience i think i want to go again next year in the u.s yeah. i want to do that differently but can you describe me what was going on for the whole week yeah i mean crazy town really really hits the nail on the head and um, you do quickly get the feeling that everyone is mad and the the right way to immerse yourself is also just becoming a bit mad and uh, really letting go of all those kind of norms and structures that normally fill your life. And, and people, people, the way people start immersing themselves in this general madness is by dressing up, really, right? Why do we dress up? Because it, it, it says, 
I don't follow models, right? And then finally, uh, if you dress on, then you're kind of like the odd one out. Yeah. And people exactly. would wear like, a, like you go half naked or completely naked, you wear like fancy kimono or some like um, very exotic things or very sexy things or silly things or like funny hats. I was there, there was a guy walking around dressed as a mushroom, giving out magic mushrooms to people. He uh, yeah. being as well. And um, I said, we can put some some pictures of your costume, yeah, and my costume, so which I told you all with that. Uh, so you dress up. And this dressing up already kind of puts you in a certain mindset of silliness. Yeah. Right. And then, well, obviously, uh, people do get quite intoxicated. But even when you aren't, um, you can put yourself into this playful mindset, uh, which because what, what drugs really do, and even alcohol does, and I mean, alcohol is quite an underestimated drug, is it puts you in the moment and makes you, forces your brain to be present. And this can be a good thing and a bad thing, by the way. If you are in a happy place and you drink alcohol, you're partying and you, you don't think about tomorrow. Might mean you might make decisions that you're regrettable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, don't think because because you don't plan, because you, it disables your planning, it just makes you present, you're in the moment. If you're feeling bad and you're very, you're having very dark thoughts and you drink alcohol, it could make it worse, right? Yeah. And people are crying over a bottle of wine because it switches off this idea that tomorrow might be better. Yeah, and they're so present in the bad spot, right? Um, and uh, this, so this presence, it can be created through substances. It can also be just for recreated or retained for a certain just mindset. And um, what it means is you walk around and you're, you're not thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow? I, there are all sorts of events and that there are these team camps and they do yoga sessions and they give food at a certain time and everything's gift based and no food trucks, you can't use money. Um, but uh, I didn't even follow any schedules. Uh, I had uh, uh, my girlfriend, uh, who is in the background, I had her uh, put my phone to a different time, to some rubbish time zone. Um, so if I accidentally glanced at the stream because I was taking a picture, I wouldn't know the time. During the entire week, I didn't know the time of day. I normally, I live by the calendar. I'm all in Ali Abdal, Thomas Frank, you know, all of these routines. I make videos about Notion, about time blocking, about Pomodoro technique, right? I'm a productivity YouTuber. And, and uh, my whole day, I live by the calendar. And I do think that this can actually free you in a way because uh, you don't have to think, well, what am I missing, right? And uh, yeah. what am I uh, not thinking about? In a way, the loop, I, I felt like the, the you go full, uh, full circle at uh, this burn because just like when I have everything planned out, and I'm on top of my work, and everything is structured, I don't have to worry that I'm forgetting something. Yeah. Last week, I also didn't have to worry about forgetting anything because there were no plans. There were no responsibilities. None of the time I had anything that was planned more than an hour in advance. I just lived and flowed, and there's this kind of sense, almost of destiny, as I said, we were destined to meet. When you're on the playa, the, they call it the playa, the site, the part of the desert where the, the burn is happening. And the playa kind of leads you. And you make all these random encounters and you walk around that I kind of have this feeling, oh, let's go this direction. And then I decided, oh, maybe tonight we do X, Y, Z. And suddenly you sit down in a camp and there's this, uh, it was this guy called the White Lion. And he sits down with us and he says, I'm a, I'm a wheat farmer. I grow my own wheat as here in South Africa. And it's legal and all of that, by the way. And uh, he gave us an edible. And this edible just kicked us off the park. I was like <laughs> so strong. And I went down this deep, deep, deep edible trip. And then, you know, next day you, walk, you wake up at the other side of the burn where you're not normally camping. And you suddenly, you wake up there and like loud voices and there's this African ceremony going on. And there are like drums and sh screams and there are all sorts of things around you. And like, wow, this is interesting. I'm gonna join in. <laughs> and then at some point you decide to wander off. And you're like, oh, someone's offering free coffee. Okay, let me have a coffee. And then suddenly you run into an interesting person, mad, just like everyone else, mm -hmm. but also free, right? And it leads you to a new experience. And it's really funny because this idea of madness equaling freedom uh, is not a new one. I mean, uh, very famously Nietzsche, I don't know if you read his, uh, the Tolle Mensch, right? Uh, which is uh, where he's proclaiming that God is dead, uh, quite famously. And it's this guy who's like, oh, completely mad and running around in the, in the, 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 the town square and go shouting, God is dead. And he looks, he looks mad to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But then there's this question raised, is he the mad one or are they the mad ones? So what is madness? And, yeah. um, 
it's uh, it's quite funny how the people who if someone were to not obey the norms of society, not wear clothes, do something, say something uh, inappropriate, uh, we consider that weird or mad. Uh, uh, so in a way, uh, the freedom and the madness go along the same spectrum, and it's a it's a wonderful experience, especially when you're someone who's very structured, yeah. very much kind of climbing the ladders of the, uh, that we build in our society, and you're suddenly reduced to these childish roots. And you're like, oh, that looks interesting. There's something colorful. Let me go and let me look at. And uh, that was very much my state of mind uh, for the past week. And uh, uh, obviously, then there are all sorts of things that they learn. It's about electronic music, which is also a lot about flow, right? Uh, progressive music, techno house is something I got to appreciate a lot over the past year. And it puts you into this flow state and you party and you forget what time it is. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I had this feeling though with the music. It's on main, mainstream music, really. Like, rarely would I hear some song that I would recognize. Usually it was just like. It's, it's, yeah. It was even funny, like, it became like white noise to me. Like, when I was up here for the first night, I was suddenly like, I missed that beat. I need that. Yes, me proper. Yeah, because otherwise I get a voice. It's like the enough. beating of the drum. Exactly, all yeah. the time, like twenty four seven. Exactly. And um, it's a somewhat like white noise because if you sleep in a silent room in with other people from moves or moves or you know something cracks, like it wakes you up. But here it's like it just here just. Oh, but that's also because the the bass trap is far away. Right? Yeah, so you're far. Yeah. If you're far away, um, you you just hear the bass. That's normal. Yeah. But um, I I don't know what music you listen to, but obviously it wasn't popular. <laughs> it was. Progressive, which it was ten, it was house, which is something that I never appreciate, by the way. Like uh, this lady over there in the back of the pro- knock on the camera, made me appreciate. Uh, I had this enlightenment last year when I, for the first time, started to appreciate techno. I was always the guy saying, "I want to go to a club where I can sing the lyrics." Yeah, I love that. Yes, I was like this, hundred percent, honestly. Can ask any of my older friends. I never got the tenor. I was like, it just be it. What is this? That's not exciting. When's the chorus coming? I want to sing the lyrics, right? I want that like Justin Bieber in the club. And I, I still, I still appreciate Justin Bieber, great musician. But I really got to appreciate techno music, and it's it's just a you, you have to enter a completely different mindset. You have to not kind of expect the next part of the song or when does uh, when's the chorus lyrics. It is a loop. It's loop based music, it's flow. And you kind of, it's like, it's like drum. It's like someone yeah. drumming, right? And you kind of, you're waving and you're ride, riding the waves, you're flowing. And it's a complete, it's a different way of dancing, it's a different way of listening to this music. But once you kind of get it, and yes, some of these substances have you get, we can talk about, it, but once you get it, even, I, I can go to a rave. I went to Berlin when Miss Monique was playing. I danced for two hours. And the dancing looks more like this, right? You're just kind of like going back and forth and you're flowing. I was stone sober. It's not like you have to take something. Well, I didn't drink, I didn't take anything. I was stone sober. I love this music so much at this point. I'm pursuing uh, becoming a DJ myself. Uh, as I, the media, so I, I do have to, like, for free well, for your viewers, uh, Nicholas Stiefel. All the content is in German, but there is a German in English for music, which is not in German, so in any language. It's my first start acting, uh, making music. Exactly. Kind of making music. Uh, and, um, well, DJing, I said this, but not really producing, but I will produce. And uh, I feel that this music is, is, it fits the event a lot because it's all about just letting go and letting it flow and not uh, when is the chorus, when is it coming, when does it end, do I know this song? No, or just like, just enjoy the beeping of the drums. Be reduced to your raw uh, animal origins. You know, like a- Africa is such a good place. <laughs> it's kind of dog, like it's uh, where we're all from. And uh, then you have for some of these tribal ceremonies going on. We can talk about the burning with the clan and why are we running naked throughout the fire. Oh, so, Richard Dockler yeah. said that we are Africans. <laughs> so what even we definitely don't have the uh, same, the very same African grand right. and grandmother. It, and there's one woman. Uh, that we all date back to. So, yeah. So, so this is just to the burning question. Yeah. Don't you have to be on drugs and join us? You don't? Absolutely not. Um, so, uh, I had Nils Hoffmann, who was a quite a quite successful uh, house producer in Germany. He was nev- never takes drugs. Uh, uh, a lot of DJs don't take drugs because they're doing it all the time, so it just wouldn't work. It would be hard. And, uh, no, um, it helps. So, there are certain drugs that work very well with this music. They work well with other music as well, um, but uh, 
they can help you understand and feel this music. And I, but I had the same. It was such an enlightenment. So I took uh, an ecstasical uh, in Paris um, at a techno rave for the first time. I had tr tried an MDMA before, but not not with techno. And um, I was like, oh my god, this feels so good. I was kind of like, I, I suddenly got it. And then I went back to London. And then the Monday after this weekend, I was like, wait a minute, let me put on that music. And I went into my Spotify and I put on the very music that was played in the rave. And I was like, oh my God, I like this. <laughs> and I didn't like it before. My girlfriend had actually played techno to me uh, on the way there. She was my girlfriend at the time. There was this Paris adventure. Yeah. And we went uh, spontaneously from London to Paris for a weekend. And uh, she showed uh, techno uh, on, her, on her phone uh, to her disappointment. Um, I uh, uh, confess uh, that I'm more into this kind of EDM, big, big drops, big uh, lyrics. Music, I, I was like, oh, it's a bit boring. But then the Monday after, I was like, oh my God, I mean, I'm not high. I still like it. Then on Tuesday, I still liked it. And then Wednesday, I still liked it. And I liked it even, uh, even more every day. And I really got into it. So it can help you understand it if you're not yet. Uh, so maybe we should arrange uh, something there, Samuel, uh, when we go to oh, maybe uh, yes. maybe Burning Man together. But do you want to go there with Burning Man? I have not. Uh, I meant to go this August. Yeah, I mean, uh, Are you going this August? Or potentially. I mean, let's see. <laughs> let's see. This August next year. Oh, no, right. Africa was such a good experience mm -hmm. that I'm not considering to go to Aspen. Right? We're literally like, OMG says it's coming up. Right? It's not, yeah. it's not impossible. But. Um, in, in, in any in any case, uh, I, I really love progressive music now. I love it even much more than, than all the other genres. It's so funny. And I don't have to take anything, for sure. Um, it's fun, uh, but um, just like with balance of uh, how much do we enjoy the moment versus how much do we plan the future. Uh, substances, right? Um, it's a big topic. Yeah. And well, what I want to caveat all of this because... Can yeah, you can ask me anything, Samuel. <laughs> and I, I might not answer. But... Uh, in, it's, uh, nah, but I would answer this. Um, I want to be very clear, it fucks people up. It mm -hmm. ends rules lives, right? And uh, people just lose it. And uh, let's take MDMA, which uh, really that kind of start in ex is the main substance in ecstasy pills. And mm -hmm. it uh, starts uh, aggressively emitting uh, serotonin in, in your brain and uh, it makes you really happy. And if you think you were happy when, I don't know, someone asked to marry you or your child was born all of that, well, you weren't that happy, not like, it's a duty level. It's yeah. a different level. It's like it's, just, it's not natural to be this happy, right? And it's um, and that might be off putting a lot of people as be like, oh, well, then you you always want that high, and yeah, it's a risk because uh, it's uh, it's not physically addictive as alcohol is, as uh, like alcohol, right? Uh, funnily, like alcohol is much more physically addictive, but it's so psychologically addictive, mm. people. And then because your kind of serotonin stores in your brain are empty. And it doesn't work as well as well. So you have to take more and people to start taking every month and then every weekend. It's very dangerous. It's slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. And I have a notion spreadsheet of when I take what and like making sure that there are the, the recommended breaks in between and so So it's very, very important to uh, be super careful okay. um, that you uh, don't end up uh, just um, slipping slowly into uh, uh, into very dangerous habits. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's one thing uh, on the first day of Africa where we took MDMA, uh, which was very fun. But uh, then what, a, a whole other thing, a whole other topic um, is uh, really for me psychedelics. I think that they much better even match this spirit of a burn. And I think psychedelics are something that on the one hand, it's well understood this use of therapy and psychologists mm -hmm. know that it's not just a bad thing, it's not just a dangerous drug, but it can actually be quite helpful. And even in even in Germany, there's a uh, legal uh, magic mushroom retreat. Oh, um, mean, there is, they have a clinical license and stuff. You can't buy it in a supermarket, but there, there you can yeah. get it legally in certain places. You can go to Amsterdam and buy uh, truffles in a coffee shop. In my house, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, but legally, right? And uh, it's not like the Netherlands is like a common yeah. broken country. So it's uh, psychedelics is something quite different from MDMA, cocaine, alcohol, all these like uh, yeah. things that. that are potentially much more dangerous. So um, uh, we took uh, an acid therapy LSD on, on Saturday 
and uh, that was that was a, a, a really truly life changing experience. And I've done psychedelics um, for the first time during the past year. Uh, during the past year, I did a couple of times. Had some uh, very deep mushroom experiences, and there's a lot of information out there how people really kind of uh, or it can be quite therapeutic. And um, I had some really negative and dark experiences uh, trying magic mushrooms for the first time. I was kind of uncovering some really deep hurts and uh, anxieties and fears. And uh, it wasn't always a good experience throughout, but then the next day I was like, wow, that was like 20 therapy sessions at once. <laughs> and the right, it was like, that was crazy. And everything kind of somewhat culminated last Saturday when um, I was a bit apprehensive because I, the past few times I took psychedelics, I was uh, kind of thrown into something quite dark and negative. I was like, do I want to go this deep? It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's like yeah. you have a therapy session, you cry and you think about something sad and like uh, you're working on your vulnerabilities could be good in the long run, but do I want this here or not? And uh, we, we did talk the LSD, we did take the LSD. And first of all, it makes you appreciate or the kind of randomness of the place, right? It makes you a bit mad. It makes you very free. It makes you kind of really silly. And if you see all these colors and you're like a child, and when you, you're saying, wow, here, like, with like 10 times the significance, you were wow. Yeah, you're just like, it's not so impressive. Like, when, when you're on LSD, things that aren't really as impressive, like, become impressive. So it's like, let's say we're sitting here, and then we're on LSD, and you're like, and we should stand up and stretch. And I'm like, wow. So now imagine a place that is truly one, right? You're like, yeah. you were standing on top of the, we were standing on top of the tree of stories as the LSD was kicking in. And we were looking at, as they were preparing the burn of the heart. There's this big heart artwork and they were starting to burn it down. Yeah, I have a nice photo. Uh, it's my like, oh, nice we, 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 we were put in some B-roll, that I thought you were B-roll, someone else is it. Um, the sunset in the background, beautiful colors everywhere. People wearing gorgeous costumes. Everything's a bit random and silly, and you're just like, wow. It's you, you. The LSD helps. It just develops a huge amplifier. And what would have been a magical memory already is like a ten times as magical memory for me. It's really like, I, I, I this moment is so present in my brain now, and, and even now it stays with. You. It's not just like you're having fun. It's like it's really deep. And then. We kind of in progress to it, and we met some people, and we, uh, and then, then the next stage was this. We went to the burn of the clan, and uh, this was it was an incredible ceremony. Everyone sits down in this huge circle around the clan symbol of Africa burn. It's a huge wooden construction, and then they do this this riff. They start this like this kind of drums, and they start rhythmically dancing, and these kind of like fire shows, and it's kind of very tribal. And then they set the thing on fire, and I was there, and I was like high on acid, and I was just, I started feeling so light, almost out of body, and I kind of was like coming to this point of resolution of kind of fears and anxieties I had worked on on previous psychedelic experiences, and they kind of started to resolve in a really positive way. So it was a great time for me, and I was starting to feel really light, and this whole atmosphere made me extremely euphoric, and then. Well, the funny thing that we kind of hinted at is that people, which I had seen earlier when Orino really stood, start taking their clothes off. It was kind of like the ultimate step of freedom, the ultimate step of back to the rules, being like a child or like a tribal warrior, whatever, right? Um, and they, they, in this already crazy place, the people take off their crazy costumes and they start running and cheering and running around the fire. But and, naked. Yeah. <laughs> and we did it. And we, you know, we, we also we took our clothes off. And we were Sunday, and you you feel weird if you run around naked through a shopping mall, but you you do not feel as weird if you are. Uh, imagine like crammed in an African yeah. tribe, and they all run around naked around the fire. You wouldn't be like, oh, this person's weird. And it felt like that, right? And we were all like naked, we we're running around the fire, and uh, I was kind of there was this almost uh, carnal energy, uh, and uh, you, I did, I just felt. Being otherwise so immersed in this highly structured and constructed society and pursuing yeah. all these fancy careers that are so removed from our hatch origins that animal creature, yeah. I was for this one moment so back to the roots. 
and it was like there are all these human animals around me and we have this connection we don't even know each other we might not even speak the same language but we speak this animal language we're kind of like our bodies are the same built the same so we are like same blood and flesh and it, it was an amazing feeling and uh, sure you could also zoom out and be like oh and a bunch of high people running around a fire take it a close up um, but I'm telling you it was an incredible magical experience it was a state of mind to have experienced that mm -hmm. is something I'm taking with me and I'm taking it with me and I'm going to go to Cambridge Mayballs and take up your clothes and put us in hopefully not because hopefully uh, I won't be asked to be there because it wouldn't be respectful, it wouldn't be appropriate but um, well you know what I, it's just as humans in our fancy offices and fancy suits and pursuing all these fancy careers uh, we sometimes forget where it comes from forget these simple pleasures and living in the more ways which I didn't this is spectrum, and not everyone has to run around the fire naked in Africa and be high on LSD. I'm not. You're not from what side, channel. That's that's uh, that's that's the 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 far end of being 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 present in the moment. You don't have to be as present, but um, there is a certain beauty in being able to experience that, and not losing sight of us. Just like I'm an animal, you're an animal. We're like we we decide to like we have all this kind of thousands of years of culture, society, and like expectations and all of that, but being able to fall back to where for most of human history, like past 300,000 years, we were mostly been doing, falling back to that is very freeing, is very relieving, and it kind of gives you a new perspective when you are stressed, when I go, this isn't going well, and my start, and like my career, and my company, and my boss, we're like, well, in the end, it's all it's all a bit of a game, and we all like a bit of like mm -hmm. there, 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 there's something there's something deeper and mm -hmm. the, and more original than that. And then you can go on and you can go and build cathedrals, which is clearly is human nature too, is to build big halls and to compose symphonies to be played in them. And all that is part of mankind as well. And I'm not saying we all have to live like tribal uh, warriors in Africa, but. Um, not losing sight of either end of the spectrum, I think, but it's, I think it's helpful. It helped me, and uh, I'm, I, I might do it again. So it made me, <laughs> maybe have the bell of the can in Africa. But uh, yeah, it's, it was a great experience. I think it's something that uh, people might not have enough in their lives, in some shape or form. It doesn't have to be this exact thing, but kind of appreciating a simple, raw human pleasures, and not solely being immersed in a lifestyle that is so unnatural in a way and his uh, i think it can be recommended do you think it would be is possible to enjoy the whole world like without taking a symbol single drop of alcohol or a drug definitely it's definitely possible and again these are amplifiers right and they are because i don't take anything nothing and i'm sure you had a great time and i think the the, the, the bigger impact would be not having your fall not being a vlogger not having to run, not having to worry uh, probably will make the bigger change and um, substances kind of force this upon you. You're not going to be planning the next chapter of your vlog on LSD. No. Uh, and uh, can be an ample, uh, I do think psychedelics can be helpful. I do think they can be therapeutic. I do think they can make you more present. If used um, correct. If because they are dangerous. And they can be extremely dangerous in your okay. And we help you so free that you're just uh, mad all the talent you're no longer fun you're no longer no longer able to function out there in the less free or normal world yeah. and uh, that's definitely a risk so you have to manage it extremely carefully uh, they can be a useful amplifier but uh, in the end of the day of course you don't need it you don't need it and uh, you can be very free and very open and very present uh, without it that it, uh, I, I would love to go to a burn and, comp and do like a completely sober burn um, I've uh, been out for that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm sure it's going to happen. I, uh, I'm i going to do uh, definitely some detoxing uh, this month. Not tonight because Alexander is making wonderful gin tonics. But uh, uh, and we were in South Africa, so we are kind of obliged to come to meet. Let us eat the wheat and make it I'm flying to Dubai where all of this is like uh, 20 years of prison. So um, I'm, I'm not going to risk that. But... Uh, yeah, uh, soon I'm going to be detoxing completely. I'm probably not going to even have caffeine for a month. And then uh, there'll be periods of my life where I'll be detoxing a lot. Uh, 
uh, probably event if I get children, right? I mean, the, I, I I like this idea of like uh, you know women are kind of forced to be pucks. It's unreasonable. It's, it's a yeah. male becoming mother, and I kind of I think about when becoming a father. It's a real no thing. Just do this. Just do this. Uh, because you're not going to do it like that, right? This is so. It's so rare that people do like a full detox for like a year. So, uh, and, and then um, there might be times where I go to burn and uh, just uh, not even have a sip of alcohol in my tea. Um, and that's great. And I'm sure it, it's going to feel a few good in its own regard. But I do think that alcohol is um, underestimated in, in our society. Read the bad. And uh, psychedelics. I think you being scientific, and uh, I think uh, you should uh, like look into the literature and uh, see if it really would have such a negative impact on our bodybuilding career or your oh. uh, career. And probably uh, less bad. Oh, well, uh, 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 maybe a, a bunch of mushrooms uh, <laughs> in in Amsterdam or in uh, Berlin. Uh, they sell more mushroom chocolate in the in the, the kiosks in Berlin than some of them. Um, might uh, even removes all of the stress and burden. No, I, like I think the reason why I don't want to try anything else is because I just had one very, very, very horrible experience with marijuana. Fairly an allergic reaction to it. Wow. And since that moment, I said I never ever want to do this again. Wow. Um, even though, you know, for some other drugs. Oh, I have there. to say some of my worst uh, experiences were on weed as well, mm. uh, and especially at the belts. Uh, because these days, uh, those muffins, uh, they are so strong. Um, so, and then they can make you so paranoid that I react quite strongly to something like that. Yeah. That's can be, it can be the, actually, in some cases. 100%. Yeah. So thanks so much for this discussion. This is a very new perspective I got on all of these drugs. I mean, obviously you're not promoting anything. I do kind of sound like I'm promoting, <laughs> but, um, no guys, I mean, honestly, I am maybe, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite unfiltered here. This is not my channel. The fire is good at all. But I'm, I'm quite unfiltered here. And I'm sure there'll be people who be like, oh, uh, how can you uh, kind of, uh, uh, make that sound so harmless? And again, I know so many people who lost it completely and like, uh, uh, they're definitely lives being ruined. But do not be tempted to put everything into just one bucket. Yeah. And I feel like we have this very, very silly and random label of drugs and that alcohol is not a drug and maybe even cigarettes is not a drug, which is just absurd it's because absurd. it's like the worst drug ever, right? Yeah. And that's not even get through hot. No, like, it's, you're like, because someone says, uh, offers me to smoke, I'm always like, is, 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 does, is it weed or tobacco? And if it's tobacco, I'm not going to smoke it, you see, because it doesn't get me high and might cause cancer. So it's like, it's bad, yeah. two bad things. Uh, at once. No, uh, it's not worth it. And um, I would uh, stay away from coke and I would, uh, I, I'm sort of like I, I'm the same people to, uh, to do heroin or, or these kind of things, but it's, it's very random how we are grouping up. Uh, uh, some countries and then somewhere you can do a ayahuasca retreat legally and then uh, here you can only, you can drink alcohol on that here, but in Germany you can drink alcohol from age 16, but then you can still not smoke weed, but the ceiling is going to be changed. It's so yeah, it out. And our mindset is so just following that tradition. Yeah. And that always so unscientific, how people think about it. So do your own research, and um, it's pretty difficult to make the case that even LSD is worse than alcohol. I'm sorry, it's, it's pretty difficult to get, make that case scientifically. So if you're a heavy alcohol drinker, if you're not that, but if you're a heavy alcohol drinker, bye. Why? Just because that's the way we've done it. And, and um, I do think that's a bit silly. Yeah. And either just people to say, about it. people they say, you know, one glass of alcohol or wine at dinner or a beer a day it doesn't really matter. But you know what? It does that. Oh, it's a Ramsey blogger. You will learn less. You will. Muslim generation is completely stopped. Yeah. If I work out and I didn't have a beer after that, basically I'd work out and to waste. It's that bad. People sometimes don't even think about how bad it was for your, you know, your regeneration of your body. So it's an effect that people really underestimate. And I really recommend people to cut down alcohol as much as possible. Also, don't encourage anyone to, you know, try out all the different drugs. I mean, sure, if you read the literature, you know you're a very disciplined person, then I think it's something that makes sense to think about. But if you're struggling to keep your life under control or have difficult, difficulties with discipline, I'd always say, like, stay away from that because it's a risk. In the end, you want to maximize your habit. Yeah. Some people yeah. jump out of airplanes, you say, oh, that's 
<laughs> Perhaps not. Uh, some people live in big cities, even though the countryside has uh, much better air for your lungs. So uh, you don't always go for the healthiest option. You don't go always go for the most reasonable option because life just might be pretty boring. And then you end up dying anyway. So uh, it's not the well, that that is, but it's just not that is extremely deadly. So um, uh, I'll, each to their own, um, and uh, hopefully uh, I will uh, also. And not lose completely and Jen uh, go for being mad, but I will regular, regularly be going mad for a week at least uh, because uh, that is just such a free and wonderful experience, I'm telling you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so glad that after five years we finally managed to meet in person. And yeah, we're going to have dinner all together now. Very fun time. Again, thanks so much for being here. Such a pleasure.